Um, we're going to get started. We've got a lot to cover in uh, just a couple hours. Hopefully, you got a chance to read the training guide in advance of this class. If you didn't, I would encourage you to go back and read the training guide. Um, it might explain a little bit more. We don't have time in this class to go through every item that we covered in the 32-page training guide. So what was our motivation for the class? Uh, much like in the strip mall class that we taught last year for strategy and tactics, a lot of the education that we've gotten in our careers, and I know for me as I promote it up, most of the books on our bibliography came from the east or the northeast. And I found myself as I studied, like Turpat's book, for example, I'm, I'm reading through it going, man, do we have that particular type of building in our city? I think maybe the McCarty building is like that or you know, various buildings, but I just wasn't sure because we're, we're getting education from you know, people 3,000 miles away and there's definitely some notable differences in certain aspects of our battlefield. So we wanted to um, do more than just a little bit of tribal knowledge that is passed on from generation to generation of firefighter, but actually have more of a consistent application of some education. And so that was our goal in creating the uh, training guide. Um, Kevin, how about if you read the learning objectives for us? Sure. <clears throat> uh, review building code, tactical indications, review building instruction, identify common benefits and problems, categorize and review multifamily dwelling types, and identify common tactics and assignments. Okay, um, so the first thing we did, just like in the strip mall training guide, we consulted the U.S. Fire Administration to find out what is our fire problem in multifamily dwellings? Is it a big issue or not? In the strip malls, we found that there wasn't a big life lost in strip mall fires, and therefore there wasn't a huge life safety aspect that we're typically dealing with in strip mall fires. However, when we talk about multifamily dwelling fires, we find that to be a little bit different. Uh, in the period between 2012 and 14, there was 410 deaths in multiple dwellings. We just had one last December here. Uh, over 4,100 injuries, and they said about 29% of our residential fires in America are in multifamily dwellings. And then lastly, the leading cause, 73%, was cooking fires. So, kind of divided into a couple sections. We're going to talk about the building and fire code. And we'll talk a little bit about building construction. Building code regulates the construction of a building at the time that it was built, whereas fire code regulates the use of the building once it's already built. Okay, So uh, it's the reason why we have high-rise buildings downtown that don't have fire sprinklers. Because in the 60s when the building was built, it wasn't a requirement to have sprinklers in the building. But if that same exact building was built today, they would require fire sprinklers in it. Therefore, the building code is not retroactive. So every three years, the fire code and building code is updated, and we don't go to building owners every three years and tell them, hey, you need to update your building with this new widget or this sprinkler system or this new alarm system. We don't do that. There would be an outcry if we even tried. So uh, the important thing to remember is typically building code is not retroactive. Fire code, when we talk about fire code, we're talking about like occupancy loading, so you can't have more than X number of people in a space, and it's based upon the size of the space, as well as the primary and secondary egress paths. That's more your fire code and occupancy classification driven. Now, as I said a minute ago, the building code is not typically retroactive, but it, there's a couple things or a couple examples that are pretty obvious where we have or the fire service has required some retroactive action uh, based on older buildings. One of those was in the Our, Lady's, Our Lady of Angels fire that happened in Chicago in 1958. And it killed, 50, or killed uh, 87 children. And some of the contributing factors in this old building were the combustible um, finishes, uh, like Wayne's coating going up the public stair that was open to each floor. And they had lacquer finishes or urethane type finishes caused a rapid fire spread. The windowsill heights were very high. It made it very difficult for some of the kids to evacuate, it made it difficult for the firefighters to be able to uh, evacuate them from ladders or rescue them from ladders. So that was a pretty significant event when you lose 87 children. And naturally, there was an emotional reaction in Illinois. And as a result of that, the Illinois legislature passed some retroactive uh, building code requirements, and they started to go in and abate some of those open stairwells, change the finishes that they could have, 
um, lower sill heights. But that happened in Illinois. And here in Boise, Idaho in 2017, we actually have some buildings that have some of the same characteristics of the building on the screen there with high sills, open stairways from floor to floor. Um, so it wasn't applied throughout the country, it was applied locally. And that's something that oftentimes happens when they have a, an emotional event that causes a public outcry. Another big event that caused some, some uh, action in older buildings and actually did make its way to the West Coast was the Weinkauf Hotel fire in Atlanta. What they had a big contributing factor that caused a lot of people to die in this incident was those open stairways again. And if you look at some of our older buildings downtown, like the Hawaii Plaza building, Idaho building, uh, the Jefferson building, the McCarty building, they too had big, beautiful grand staircases when you entered them back when they were originally built. Well, that's a, a, obviously a good pathway for fire and products to be able to travel. If you go into those buildings today, you can see that they're all compartmented off floor by floor, and they've added doors and enclosures. And that was in part because of the Weinkauf Hotel fire disaster in 46. So there are a couple examples where uh, building code, not while it's not retroactive, it's not like nothing ever happens as a result of disasters. Sometimes, if it's a big enough or emotional enough event, um, there is some action that occurs. But let's talk a little bit about early codes. What you're looking at is a rendering of the uh, Great Front Fire of Rome. This happened in 64 AD, and it had a lot of wood buildings that were very close to each other. And once they got going, it just was a big conflagration that we have seen in a number of big fires in America as well. Well, the first codes came after the Rome Fire when Emperor Nero said, you know what? We have our new urban plan, and the new urban plan said we have to have wider streets, we have to have a height limit on buildings, and we want you to use stone rather than wood. Well, it took centuries before America had enough big fires and we did the same thing, but eventually we too modified those building codes through the years. And what we saw was the earliest codes, including in Boise, they had what are called fire limits. And the goal with the fire limit was, hey, let's see if we can limit this fire to just the block of origin. Then we looked at, let's see if we can limit it to the building of origin, then the floor of origin. Now we have room of origin, and we're talking about void protection. And like I said, this isn't a code class. I'm not going to put you to sleep with talking about a bunch of building code or fire code. But one thing that I want us to recognize is that oftentimes in operations, building code is just not sexy. You know, we get put to sleep. We have a nice silo built between fire prevention and operations. And oftentimes operations just doesn't give much attention or energy towards understanding our building codes. And what I want to impress upon you guys is just it's one of those things where we don't have to get down into the weeds and know all the specific details of how many feet and um, real, you know, detail specifics. But what we should understand and realize is some of the big ticket items. What we're looking at here is the new Vista Apartments, which is uh, off of Capitol Boulevard over near the college. It's a very large building they built. And the red lines that I put on the screen there, those are the firewalls that are built in that building. The building code required them, because of the size of the building, to have those firewalls. So essentially, if you look at it, we took one large building and we made it into three buildings. Well, if we're operating from a position of ignorance in operations, and we pull up, set our air brake, and we run our hose up, and we just go right down this corridor, right through the, the raided fire door, what have we done? We just undermined the very thing that the building code put in place to protect us and to help us, we undermined it by not saying, you know what, it's on this wing, so let's make access here and make sure that our fire doors are closed. So we're dealing with a smaller building section rather than a larger one. I was in Europe earlier this year, and one of the things that I found when I was in Europe was that they're kind of ways ahead of us in, in certain aspects of, of uh, fire suppression. One of the things they have is on the right, is a little sticker that's on all doors in their commercial buildings and residential, you know, uh, multiple dwellings, where it tells you if you're going through a rated door assembly. So whether you're a firefighter or a civilian, if you see that, it's pretty obvious that that door should be kept shut, right? This is a pretty decent example of what can happen in your corridor. If that, I had a different picture I couldn't find for this class, but it has the pictures taken <coughs> beyond the fire door. You could see the door was closed. It looks a lot like that. Beyond the fire door, it was really clean and nice. I was pretty surprised at how banked down and nasty the smoke was at our Civic Plaza fire on the seventh floor um, 
when I went through the final fire door versus just before it. It did a great job of uh, holding the products of combustion back. Specific to R2 occupancies, which is uh, the International Building Codes uh, classification for apartment houses that are uh, th uh, three plexes or more, um, they're required to have one hour fire partitions in each apartment. So the walls, floors, and ceilings are supposed to have a one hour rating on that. R1 is for transient use like hotels. R3 is for semi-transient use like boarding houses, college dormitories. The idea behind it, R1 has greater protection requirements because you may be just staying there for one night. And likewise, you're less familiar with where the exits are or where you're staying. In an apartment, a little bit less requirement because theoretically you should be living there for probably at least a year or six months with a lease. What we're looking at in the picture here is the fire that A-Shift had at Curtis and Overland area. It's a row home style apartment building. And this is the draft stopping that it was installed above uh, the fire apartment. And that helps limit that spread. So what does the building code say about um, draft stopping? Well, starting about 1970, the, the code's pretty specific on having draft stopping in unoccupied spaces. And that's designed to prevent airflow to feed a fire and prevent heat transfer, heat spread, which theoretically should slow down that fire's progression and give us a chance on it. So what it says currently, and it's said for a number of years, is a maximum of 3,000 square feet of unoccupied space or above every two dwelling units. Well, if you think about that, 1,500 square foot for an apartment is kind of a big apartment. So in most cases, you should have some type of draft stopping above every two apartments. Now it may be transversely applied, like in this diagram here, it could be longitudinal. Uh, it's tough to say, we don't know for sure, but just to know that it's uh, most likely, in most cases, if your building is newer than 1970, it should have some draft stopping there, and it should be limiting the unoccupied space, like the attic, to about two apartment units. However, we always have the disclaimer, we have a lot of these in, in building construction. One of the things we run into here is there's areas of our city that used to be unincorporated Ada County. They don't have a fire department, they have regular building inspectors that are doing inspections. The Whitney District and the Cole Collister Fire Districts, uh, when they were you know, formed in the 60s, they didn't have a fire prevention bureau or staff to do a bunch of inspections. So what we found is there's some of those buildings that used to be in Cole Collister or Whitney that don't have the draft stopping, even though the building code said it should. So it's not an absolute. We still have to take a look. One other thing too, uh, remember too that the older the building, the less likely, even if the fire uh, draft stopping was put in, the less likely it's actually be in place intact and be able to do its job. Just from age, wear and tear, uh, from people punching through with cable lines, etc. Sometimes they put doors in those so you can access all the way through the attic. A lot of times those are left open. Yeah, if they're trying to spray in extra insulation or something, that's kind of a hindrance. So you just cut a hole in it, spray your insulation in cabling last 25 years in the internet era. Chief, I have a question. Yeah. 3,000 square feet, is that like surface area of the attic space or is that like the living space below it? It's the unoccupied space. Okay. Yeah. But like I said, typically it's going to be smaller than that where you hit that envelope of two dwelling units, two apartments. Okay. I said at the beginning of the class that you know we don't have time to go through the you know whole training guide, but one of the things we're going to touch on is a couple things specific to multifamily dwellings when it comes to construction. But we wanted to take a minute to try to explain a little bit of the direction we're going with teaching building construction to incumbents like you guys. We teach all of our recruits to the Brannigan level. We've used Brannigan for a long time in this department, and Brannigan has some really good information in it. But Brannigan, much like NFPA 220, just says it's type one through five construction. We don't know if it's type three unreinforced masonry or type three modern ordinary. We don't know if it's type five balloon frame or type five platform frame. Those are pretty significant differences. So what we did is we were looking for a curriculum that, that gave us a little bit more for the, the line firefighters that are operating in a time compressed state where 
you need to know a little bit more than just type one through five and what type of things should we look at to be able to know how something's put together and thus how that thing will fail. And what we came up with was a curriculum called The Art of Reading Buildings. And it was written by uh, uh, John Mittendorf, who's a longtime LA City truck captain, who's kind of one of the building construction gurus. And he co-wrote the book with Dave Dotson, who's the guy who came up with The Art of Reading Smoke, or he kind of perfected it, The Art of Reading Smoke curriculum. So they joined up and made a book called The Art of Reading Buildings. One of the first things they do in the book is talk about recognizing the era of construction. Because if you can know the era, you can understand the techniques they use during that time period and thus understand the vulnerabilities to those techniques. So the three or the four eras, the easiest way to be able to remember them for me is think pre-World War I. So World War I started in 14. So 1850 to 1914. Industrial era is pre-World War II, so World War I ended in 18. <clears throat> World War II started in 39, so pre-World War II. Then you got post-World War II, which was legacy, and then about 1970 to present, you have the modern era. So you might notice that those numbers don't line up. It's not real clean cut. And while the building code required certain things that had to change effective that year, uh, the building code doesn't typically drive exactly what technique you use to build your building. The building code is based on performance. So it says you need to have X number hour rating in this type of occupancy or this type of building that you're building. We don't care how you get there. We'll give you a pass if you put sprinklers in it, but if you don't put sprinklers, you gotta put this size of a firewall or this type of partition. Why is there a big range in differences? Well, it comes down to economics, really. If you think about it, if Tim is a, a contractor that's been doing it for 30 years and he's done hand stack roofs, and all of his subcontractors are used to, they're kind of tradesmen, they're used to doing hand stack roofs. You've never brought a crane to your job site. And then you have, you know, Gary's running a, this newfangled pre engineered lightweight truss down the block. You're going to look at him and go, man, I don't know about that new trust thing, you know. And he's going to look at you and go, man, that old guy's got scales on his back. Well, pretty soon, he's probably going to be kicking your butt when it comes to economics. He's going to be able to underbid you because he doesn't have to pay as high a wage to more of a craftsman building, you know, a craftsman type trust. He's got a pre-engineered one. He might go a little bit faster. After a while, you're either going to retire or you're going to say, you know what, I might need to relook at how I would bid this so you can compete, compete with him. The point is there's usually a period of years before there's a big change. So what does that mean to us when we talk about ERA? Well, the Gang Nail Trust was patented in 1959 in Florida, and no doubt it took a number of years before we started seeing pre-engineered lightweight trusses in Boise, Idaho. So if the house that you're going to is pre-1960, unless it's been remodeled, it's a pretty good chance it's gonna be a hand stack, ridge beam, and rafter type roof. Likewise, the pre-engineered eye trust, uh, trust, which the TJI trust was patented here in Boise by Trust Joyce McMillan in 69. Pretty decent chance we probably started seeing some engineered eye beams and floor assemblies in Boise in the early 70s. So that's why the eras don't perfectly line up. Just a couple images of buildings from our city that meet those different eras. This is the Parkview Apartments off Crescent Rim. It's an old frat house at 2nd and Main. Franklin, down by St. John's Cathedral, that's Alpine Manor, or I think they call it Laytaw Village Apartments now, I've had a few fires there. Um, so anyway, just a couple different examples in our city. So how do you know for sure is the question. How do you know for sure what year the building was built? I mean, you can ask the owner, the current owner, they may or may not know, well, I heard it was built in this time, it's really not that definitive. I'm going to show you a little technique that you can find out exactly when the building was built by pinging the, the uh, county records. And this is what I've found to be the easiest way to do it rather than trying to put in an address search. Because if the parcel, the property parcel, is not tied to that specific address, you run into trouble. So when you have a strip mall and there's 15 addresses there, you spend a bunch of time trying to find it. So if you just go on the internet, it doesn't have to be on a city workstation, and you Google. I've got it open on the new Chrome right now. If you Google uh, Boise Maps, first tab or third, fourth tab. If you Google Boise Maps, it's going to pull up this property viewer map. 
And when you do that, all you gotta do is go down here, make sure you use this plus and minus to zoom, not up in the taskbar. And you zoom in and you just find what parcel. Once you start to zoom in far enough, notice the green lines appeared. So just keep zooming in until you find the parcel you're wanting to find out when that thing was built. Where are we? We're at Maine and 26th, it looks like. Let's see if we can find a, let's look at this guy. So we're at 22nd in Maine. Go up, hit point. You mark your spot. Notice I had an R number that pulled up there in the, in the left side window. Go over to that R number. When you click it, it'll pull it up a little bit more specifically. And this A to land records, it doesn't look like it, but it's a hot link. So when you click the A to land records, it'll pull up an image of the building. So you confirm that's the correct building. <coughs> And then see there you got tabs, details, valuation, taxing districts. We want to go to the characteristics tab and go to commercial. And that tells us that building was built in 1937. So it's got some type of veneer that they put over the original building. But that gives you a pretty good idea that it was built in 37 and it was remodeled in 2003. So if Gary decides he wants to do a little pre-planning with his crew in the afternoon, he says, hey boys, we're going to go check out this building. He can go look ahead of time, figure out when it was built, and he can start thinking, okay, in 1937, let's see, that was right when reinforced masonry became part of the code, so I'm going to be looking for these types of things. And you can just operate from a little bit more of an educated perspective at onset. Also, if you want to go down the road of finding out what was going on with remodel, you can contact the county and find out a little bit more detail about that remodel that happened in 2003. So, in our city, when we talk about multifamily dwellings, those R2 occupancies, we really have all five types of construction. But remember, we're not talking high rise here. We're talking four stories or less, so, and three, three units or more. So, we're focusing on the two predominant types of construction for this little refresher, which is type three and type five. Can uh, anyone tell me? Characteristics of ordinary construction? Masonry walls, wood, wood constructed roof assembly. Good, yeah, so um, brick or CMU, some type of masonry constructed load bearing walls, uh, and then you're going to have wood guts, is what a lot of times people say. You may or may not have wood floor assemblies. It could be on slabs, single story, but if it's multi story, most likely it's going to have some sort of wood. The roof will have some type of wood in it. But the question is, are all ordinary constructed buildings built the same? We've pretty much always just taught ordinary construction. And when you read Brannigan, he's got like one sentence that makes mention of unreinforced masonry versus reinforced masonry. And it really kind of gives short shrift to how important that is for us to recognize. Because when we look at unreinforced versus reinforced, some of the most dangerous buildings we'll ever operate in, some of the safest buildings we'll ever operate in. In 1933, the Long Beach earthquake occurs and that kills a number of people collapses a whole bunch of buildings right outside LA and it was the unreinforced buildings that were all collapsing so can you guys anyone just kind of blurt out characteristics of unreinforced masonry sand line mortar sand line mortar, sand line mortar is a big one right Roads. so it's water soluble so especially when you're thinking about a parapet that's freestanding and you have a driving rain or wind over the course of 100 years, it erodes those mortar joints away. And those parapets are pretty susceptible to any type of torsional or impact loading, whether it be a vehicle, an earthquake, significant wind, a master stream, that kind of thing. What else? So sandline mortar, what else? No, no, no rebar. No rebar, right? So reinforced masonry. Um, what's the strongest geometric shape? Triangle triangle it's the simplest and strongest shape right so that's our trust principles built on triangles what happens to a square when the square is loaded torsionally it tips it elongates it becomes either a parallelogram or if you're a geometry nerd a rhombus right so uh, after the 1933 earthquake the building code was due for its upgrade or its change in 1935 and they required reinforced masonry. With reinforced masonry, they said, no more taking your roof decking or your floor decking and just doing straight sheeting, common groove sheeting like this. Because what you're doing is essentially making a series of squares. It said, from now on, you need to do diagonal sheeting. 
what you're doing is you're creating a series of triangles and thus stiffening up the building. Okay, so 1935 and beyond, diagonal sheeting, Portland cement is introduced to the mortar. No longer can you use sand lime mortar that's water soluble. What other things? Can you give anything else? Rebar. Yeah. We said rebar, yeah. How about parapet height? So in the early days, if you guys all had a, an occupancy or a building and you wanted your building to look more prominent than the neighbors, just make a bigger, taller parapet, right? And so they had some pretty tall parapets in these unreinforced buildings. And no surprise, whether it be just a regular structural fire and you have fire blown out on alpha, the steel that's supporting that parapet, as that starts to flex or twist, creates a little bit of a torsional load and it dumps the parapet on the sidewalk. A lot of firefighters have been killed that way. So in unreinforced masonry, they said no more, no more tall parapets, max height of 16 inches. Okay. But we still have those old, ordinary, constructed uh, unreinforced masonry buildings still out there. So 1935 is kind of your, your breakover point. And we introduced modern ordinary, which is typically going to be like your cinder block walls, CMU walls, with some type of wood truss assembly uh, in the top. Could be either kind. If you're not aware, those are the most dangerous because it doesn't even take fire to delaminate the OSB web. Just heat can cause that to collapse. CMU walls, if it's a load-bearing wall, it has to have reinforcing bars. We're going to show you a couple videos real quick. So they got a master stream going. They've gone defensive. You can see there's a little bit of a collapse on the inside where the roofs come down. <coughs> the roof rafters have burned through and, and given the way they're designed to collapse in on, in on itself and not take the wall down. But that parapet is an Achilles heel. Notice what happens when that master stream is directed towards that parapet here. Oh. Takes the whole parapet and the little canopy that was built, suspended, and, and attached to that parapet. This one's quicker, Vancouver, British Columbia. That big ass stone cornice could have been wood with the terracotta covering, but nevertheless, that big cornice just collapsed. Okay, so now we've established unreinforced masonry, reinforced masonry, 1935 is when the building code changed that. But another big event happens from where my family's from in Bakersfield. The Tehachapi earthquake happens in 1959 in California, and a number of people are killed again. Parapet walls collapse again. And it was those old unreinforced masonry buildings that caused the, the majority of the destruction. The reinforced buildings performed really well but the unreinforced were a problem. Because this happened in California, it was naturally a fairly emotional event there. The California legislature, much like Illinois, passed some retroactive uh, building upgrades that were required, and there wasn't as much pushback because they were all affected by it. Well, it actually went more than just in California because if we look at some of our buildings, we can see some of these earthquake up, you know, retrofits that were done to ours. Parapets, even on old unreinforced buildings are cut down to 16 inches max height. They're putting parapet caps on those. They're tying with steel. They're tying the parapet to the roof decking. Uh, if you go into the linen building, uh, I took the fire nuggets class they had there. And as I'm sitting there, you can see uh, the decking on the floor above. In the middle of the room, it was straight sheeting like that. But as you get towards the corners, it was diagonal sheeted. So they stiffened it up. They said either you got to strip out the sheeting and do it diagonal or put plywood over the top to give it a little bit of shear strength. They also added some spreader type bars that they anchored, <coughs> beam anchors, for those. Now that's going to undermine your fire cut, right? Because it's designed to be able to burn through itself and fall, fall inside the building and not take the wall down by levering it. If you put that on, it undermines it. But a lot of these old buildings, as the wood shrinkage occurred in that old growth timber, um, you had less and less material on that fire, that, that shelf. So that's ordinary. Any questions on ordinary? Remember, unreinforced, reinforced, modern. Yeah. Are the parapet caps just to kind of tie that parapet and the rest of the walls? Uh, or it's, is it to actually cap the unreinforced mortars to keep water off it? Um, probably a little bit of both, because some of those angles actually were anchored to the caps as they went back. I don't know if it's a water thing. I, I don't know for sure. So let's talk about wood frame construction. 
I said earlier that just to know that it's wood frame construction, I mean, that's good, but it's somewhat limited in value. But if we look at the era of construction, we can be suspicious of what we need to look at. So our, plat, our uh, balloon frame era was about 1833 to 1940. There's that period of overlap again. Platform frames started to come into play 1930 to present. A couple images on the left, balloon frame on the right, platform. What's our issue with platform frame there, Tim? With platform or? Oh, sorry, balloon frame. Balloon frame, um, the, <coughs> the studs are all the way down to the crawl space and all the way up to the attic. So if there's a fire that starts in the basement or in the crawl space, it can move up inside the wall all the way to the right. attic. Or the so we need to, if we have an attic fire, we should probably check our basement before we get too excited, right? Otherwise, we're kind of just treating a symptom up there. It's kind of like going in to fight your attic fire when it was an exterior start and you haven't slowed that main body of fire down. Right. Another issue we have is the, the floor studs. The floor joists are all open, too. So it runs up the wall and then the floor right. joists. Now, I would assume Chief Ramey's the same way I am, but if we're fighting fire in a balloon frame building, and it's pretty clear to me when I'm seeing smoke pressurizing from multiple seams all over and it's pretty obvious that it's actually in the structure, I'm not gonna give you as near as much time as I would in a pl platform frame type building. Because if you think about it, this floor assembly is being supported by that ribbon board or that ledger board, right? So if we're burning in the walls there and this goes, it's kind of like a, a house of cards when it comes to platform or balloon frame. Platform, on the other hand, we basically build one floor at a time, set on top of the other. So instead of a catastrophic collapse, we see more of a localized collapse in most cases on platform. I'll show you a couple. You guys may have seen this video of the uh, balloon frame collapse, but it pretty much illustrates the point. House of cards, balloon frame construction. Because remember, the walls are supporting the floors. The floors are helping stiffen up the walls. So that's why when we're talking about a balloon frame constructed building, the fire's actually into the voids. We don't have near as much operating time and VCs should be thinking about that. Platform frame on the other hand. Now Hill Road is a total anomaly, 6,200 square foot home, two by four supporting instead of two by sixes, they added a third floor. There was all kinds of stuff that was renovated and added outside the permit process. Pretty significant fire burning for quite a while and we had the, the roof trusses collapse down. You can see that there's you know a little bit of floor collapse that eventually occurs but it's not a house of cards like catastrophically collapsing. It's usually more of a localized type collapse in platform frame construction. So again to know that your era is an era when they did use balloon frame, that's something that we really need to rule out, make sure that we're not dealing with a balloon frame constructed building. Okay, um, we'll talk a little bit about common benefits and problems and I'll pass the mic to Walker. Um, so tell me some of the common benefits we would expect in multifamily dwellings and some of the common problems that we can anticipate for multifamily dwellings. Very well compartmentalized. Yeah, compartmentalization in a multifamily dwelling is really good. So again, usually it's gonna be more of a localized type collapse because you have partition walls that are supporting the bottom cords of the truss in modern. Uh, if it, it could be balloon frame, so you would have some of the balloon frame con construction uh, characteristics, but that's typically gonna be in an old style or converted. Most of our battlefield is gonna be modern. Uh, so yeah, com compartmentalization helps us from a structural stability standpoint as well as a fire growth standpoint. What else? More likely to have alarm systems. Yeah, so modern system, modern built buildings may have sprinklers, may have a modern alarm system. It's good. What else? Anyone? Draft stopping. Yep, if it's uh, modern, that amazingly the Uniform Building Code, which we were built under, first mentioned draft stopping in 1927, but we really didn't see good uniformity till about the early 70s. So uh, how about uh, rural 
Letha, Idaho. Do they have too many multifamily dwellings in Letha or Sand Hollow? <laughs> You're looking for water supply, Chief? Yeah, water supply, right. So there's just lots of hydrants around a yeah, apartment complex. There's not an urban density in Letha, Idaho that supports a multifamily dwelling. When I asked the folks from Sand Hollow how their municipal water supply was, they said it was non existent. So Usually you're gonna have a decent water supply system, multiple hydrants, probably a municipal system. So water supply is not typically an issue for us. Draft stopping is another benefit. What about problems? Truckies, what, what, what are you expecting for fire travel and spread? Where are you looking? It's gonna go out of the window and in the upper floors or out up. If you're on the upper floor apartments, it's gonna go into the roof on the yeah. eaves. So your eaves have your soft spread event spread more than Yep. So you have your soffit vents on the eaves, right? It's a great way for it to go in. What about um, when we're talking floor to floor to floor spread outside of auto exposure? What other issues do we have that can cause it to spread? Pipe chases. Where they just yeah, common pot pipe chases, right? We, we mirror image our apartments so we can share a plumbing chase. It's more economical to do that. So it's a great place for fire to travel. A couple other things that we have that we didn't mention, brick veneers. Brick veneers are just, just just attached to the wall board with a little aluminum tab or maybe a masonry truss. So if you have a significant fire going in one of those buildings, you really need to pay attention to the, the veneers if there's a veneer on there. Been a number of firefighters killed from brick veneers letting go. Open stair treads. I know in the A shifts fire uh, in Nines District, they had the, the concrete spall away and erode in those open stair treads once the breezeway was taken over by fire. Uh, NFPA 13R sprinkler systems. So that is a residential sprinkler system that is used for just the occupied spaces. So your voids, your plumbing voids, your attic space, your floor plenums are not gonna have sprinkler protection. So in Gilbertson's example, top floor fire, maybe it's a barbecue, maybe it's fireworks, goes out, hits that soffit, and gets in the attic, you're gonna have problems, right? The sprinkler system is not going to help you there. Uh, hose line management can be an issue. You know, multiple hose lines going to different exposures. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then one of the big ones that we deal with in our garden apartment complexes is access. Whether it be apparatus access, getting clogged up inside there, or uh, being the building access. How long a stretch we have to actually get to the building or our objective. All right. Mike's going to talk about the different types and how we broke them up in our training guide. Cool. Okay, so <clears throat> you guys saw we, we uh, categorized multifamily dwellings uh, into four what we would call relatively general categories. We certainly could have tried to find a category for every conceivable different type of uh, multifamily dwelling out there, but that would just become more cumbersome. That's not our goal. Our goal is really to have some common terminology. Uh, when I say row home, Cody, you probably have one idea. TJ, you probably have another idea, right? When I say um, a um, garden apartment, you guys, I could probably get three different answers right there, right? So what we want to do is really standardize those, those, uh, that terminology um, and really, if you think about it, what we want is we want for that first arriving officer when he gets on scene to paint a very clear, concise picture in that initial report that will cue in everyone else that's coming in behind him. And when I say everyone, I mean every riding position is going to have a certain thing that they're going to cue into on this particular type of multifamily dwelling. And uh, we're not going to be able to uh, identify every conceivable multifamily dwelling out there, but. Uh, I think the categories we came up with will probably capture about 90%, uh, which will, will get us on that same page uh, early on. Um, <clears throat> so the types of multifamily dwellings, you guys remember from the training guide, uh, center hallway, garden apartments, old style and converted, those are actually kind of two different animals, but we put them together, and then uh, row homes. Start with center hallway. So a center hallway, I think it's pretty obvious everyone understands there's a center hallway that runs transversely through the, uh, the building, right? Kind of what some people might call the spine, right? So to get to your apartment, you have to go inside into a protected area, go into this center hallway area, and then uh, you can get into your 
personal and private area, your, your uh, unit. Uh, these will be one to four stories in height. After that, we're going to start looking at probably calling them high rise because then we're going to start seeing high rise features like standpipes and, and things like that. Um, apartments, dormitories, uh, even hotels. Remember, hotels are still considered multifamily dwellings. It's, uh, it's a transient use, but they are uh, residences. Uh, era, these go all the way back. Big, wide range, historic through modern. Uh, as such, think about that. We talked about the difference, the implications of era. And there's a few things when I think about era uh, that really become big ticket items to me that I want to think about. Era is going to drive the construction, right? It's going to drive the construction type as well as the technique. So uh, if it's uh, an older building that's wood frame, it's going to use conventional techniques, possibly uh, wood frame, as opposed to a modern building. Uh, if it's wood frame, it is going to be platform construction with lightweight materials. Some of the other things to think about with, from that era perspective are the fire protection features, such as sprinklers and draft stopping, uh, as well as some of the other fire separations. So really be thinking about that. The era is going to tell you a lot about uh, how that building is going to behave um, when it's on fire. Um, some considerations with the center hallway, uh, obviously, because uh, it opens to an interior hallway, if that hallway is compromised, if the door to a unit that's on fire is compromised, we're going to get smoke in that interior area, uh, which is going to make it more difficult to find the fire. Uh, it will impact our stretch. It will certainly cut off uh, egress for occupants, right? So uh, if we do have fire in uh, that hallway, uh, we need to make sure that, uh, take a minute, find out where that, uh, from the outside, try and determine where that fire is actually at before you commit. So which, which stairwell you're going to go to. One other thing about era with these two, remember, if it's old enough, it's not going to have a protected stairwell. So what does that mean? Fire can go all the way from, really, the basement to the top floor, unimpeded. And now everyone is trapped inside. And it makes it a lot more complicated for us to, to do our fire attack. Here's some examples. This is the Barton Apartments in 9 Sistrict. Uh, what area do you think this is from? Modern era. Modern, yeah. This was built in the 1990s. So what type of construction? <clears throat> Wood frame, uh, so you suspect for the roof structure, probably lightweight engineered truss, right? Um, it could be, could have uh, sprinklers, it actually does, but it's going to be an R13 system, which means the, the uh, void space, the attic, is not going to be sprinklered. Um, they could have sprinklered it, uh, the trade-off is, uh, but they probably didn't. They probably just put in draft stopping uh, to avoid having to put sprinklers in the, in the attic. <clears throat> Here's another one in Nines District. This is 3350 Collister uh, era. I'll just tell you, like 80s. What, what kind of construction do you think that is? It's CMU walls, right? So what could it be? Could be ordinary. Could be non-combustible, right? Well, surprisingly, I, I didn't know this either, uh, but uh, a pre-fire plan revealed that this is actually a non-combustible building. So um, it is sprinklered, and, uh, but yeah, even non-combustible is a possibility. It's got the like, six-inch deep steel bar joist trusses with Q-decking. All right, garden apartments. This is uh, one of the ones that we really wanted to define because in the fire service, depends on what publication you read or what uh, journal, you'll get a variety of different ideas or definitions of what it is. Um, I think the most common characteristic that most fire service people identify is that it is a, uh, an apartment where your unit opens to the outside. It opens to the weather. Whether it's covered with a, a breezeway or some kind of uh, an alcove or whatever, it still opens to the outside. A lot of people will add a lot more characteristics to it, but for us, we're just going to define it as you enter from the outside uh, directly into your apartment unit. So you don't have to go into an interior alcove or vestibule. You go directly in. These are typically built in complexes, right? So there's going to be a whole bunch of these buildings. Uh, implications, we already talked about this. Access is going to be a, a problem with these. Both getting your vehicle into that complex and around uh, the cars, carports, uh, police vehicles, whatever, other fire apparatus. But then actually to get into the building itself. Longer host stretches, getting ladders to 
um, where you want to go, your aerial is not going to get to the back side of, of most of these, right? Most of you aren't going to go off-road with your aerial. Um, now, the, the other aspect to these is they're generally the living space. What you rent out is one floor. Uh, most of these, they may be a three-story building, but you're renting a single floor unit. The exception to this is what a lot of apartment owners, property owners are calling either loft units or townhouse units, which means uh, the building is otherwise single story units. So you show up, I want to rent an apartment, okay, here's your options. Oh, you have a little bit more dough? Great, you can get a two story unit or what they call a loft unit. So this is the uh, Whistler Lane apartments, coincidentally also in Nines District. Uh, all these units here are single story except that one there. You can rent that out. You got a little bit more living space. You got more kids. You got a jam in there. Whatever. Uh, the consideration we need to think about here is it's got it's got an access stair from the first floor to the second floor of that unit. So, and it's not protected. So it's unimpeded travel of fire from that first floor kitchen fire up to the uh, area where everyone's sleeping. Now we're going to further define garden apartments. You guys remember from uh, the training guide, and we're going to define them based on how uh, all those entry points for apartment units are organized. <clears throat> the first style is called an alcove. And in this, uh, essentially all the uh, uh, apartment units are going to be accessed through a very narrow hallway on the first floor or a small landing on the second floor, uh, which we call an alcove. Um, so here's an example of an alcove. So you want to come into this looking down. You want to come into this apartment. Doesn't matter what floor it is. I come in here, there's gonna be a door there, there, something. So I have to come into this alcove to get to the apartments on the first floor, or I go up some stairs, get to a very small landing, and get into those uh, apartments there. So they concentrate them in a small area that sort of looks like a three story or a, a three sided chimney, right? Anyone see any implications to that? No, so, no, no, I. Uh, this is a good example right here of, of uh, this issue. So we have a fire on the first floor, doors uh, been compromised, or we actually make entry in there, and now fire is filling that three-sided chimney, and then anyone above is either trapped, or if they're actually on the landing above, then they're going to get burnt like, like that. So that could be occupants or it can be us. Think about that when you're making entry to those first floor apartments. Door control will be uh, very important. Uh, <clears throat> consideration. We started seeing these in the 1970s, so remember, era in construction, mostly wood frame. Um, and you'll hear this over and over again. Like, the, the big void space that's, that uh, where fire can really take off on us is going to be that attic or cock loft area. <clears throat> Here's some examples. Uh, this is actually ordinary construction. It's got uh, CMU walls. Uh, on Bravo and Delta and wood guts. Here's some more. You can see the alcove. Uh, these can be two or three stories. There's a whole knife. This, these are actually three story. It's got a half story uh, on the first floor. Uh, on this one, there's going to be a mirror image on the other side. There'll be another alcove on the uh, Charlie side. But you can have multiple alcoves on these that access, concentrate those openings. Uh, and remember, besides the fact that that is a nice little chimney for fire to, to uh, reside in and cut people off, uh, what's the area uh, like to, to operate? Have you thought about how you're going to stretch a hose line in that area? Mm -hmm. Good. So remember, the writing, when we hear these different types report over the radio, uh, it should be cueing in, you into what your job is and how this type of apartment is going to affect your job. The next style is a breezeway. So a breezeway, I think, uh, does anyone not know what a breezeway is? It's a hallway, an exterior hallway that goes from typically Alpha to Charlie side uh, all the way through. And that's where all of the, the entries for apartments are concentrated. So here's an example. You roll up, here's Alpha side. Breezeway goes through. There's stairs on both sides here. And there'll be four doors that you can access uh, those apartments there. You have multiple breezeways in one uh, uh, apartment building. You can have a combination of breezeway and alcoves on the two ends. <clears throat> uh, 
Now with these, that situation where fire getting in the, in the entry area, in the breezeway, not as big of a deal as an alcove, but it's still a problem, something we need to think about. I'll show you a picture here shortly on that. Uh, era, 1970s on, so uh, just to understand what that means for the construction and fire protection features. There you go, that's just a, a floor plan. This is what it looks like, you can see all the way through. And this was the uh, Stoker Lane fire, so um, I mean, you can still, those, those breezeways can become untenable, mm -hmm. cutting off access for occupants and putting anyone that's above, including our people, in jeopardy. Exterior hallway. In essence, think uh, your classic motel layout. So there's going to be an extra hallway that runs the length of the building, and you've got access to, to your unit uh, from that balcony or the, the um, sidewalk on the first floor. These can go full depth, so if I go in one of these apartments, I can walk to the back side and I've got a balcony or something on the other side, or there can be another uh, set of entry points on the other side, so another balcony and a whole other set. Uh, with these, we have a little bit better access uh, and egress for occupants. Construction, now this will be possibly a little bit earlier, you know? Uh, probably the 50s, 60s when we start seeing motels pop up around the country, right? So, um, more than likely gonna be wood frame though. All right, the next style, old style and converted. We put those together. <clears throat> uh, old style is an apartment building, multifamily dwelling that was built with that intention. As opposed to converted, it's an old mansion, single family dwelling that someone said, hey, I'm gonna chop this thing up, make some money, rent out a whole bunch of rooms. Uh, these are old style, implies that they're older buildings, right? So the era is gonna be uh, hyster historic and into industrial as such, wood frame uh, with more conventional techniques uh, or even ordinary construction. Here's an example, these are the White Savage uh, apartments. What do you think? Old style or was this converted? Old style. Old style. Old style, right. It's hard to feature that as being a single family dwelling uh, that someone converted. That was clearly uh, built that way. Uh, some of the things to consider with these old style. When you walk in to, to gain access to these different apartments, there's gonna be a vestibule when you step inside here. Um, and it's much like, um, um, well, like the old schools, they're going to be really ornate wood finishes, highly flammable finishes, uh, you know, some kind of urethane or lacquer finish of, of wood wainscoting all the way up. That vestibule runs from first floor all the way to the top floor. So if that becomes compromised, now everything inside. Now, it's sort of like the alcove style apartment, except it's enclosed. Now it's a like a four-sided chimney. And it can also start in the basement. So fire can go run from basement all the way up. <clears throat> and this is clearly what style you think. Converted. Converted. One of the problems with this is, uh, besides all the other issues that come with the age and the type of uh, um, construction issues that we'll have, uh, imagine how they're going to chop this up. So, Jimmy, I tell you, hey, Engine One, I want you to go up and I want you to do the primary of that room. You might know this because it's your district, but how do you get there? Uh, there's an entrance on the, on the alpha side, the street side, the stairwell that goes up. Great, you know, but, I mean, did you know that? No. No. The, the layout is completely unpredictable. It's not going to be very difficult for us to, to access all those different areas. And keep in mind, too, some of these modifications, when they change this to a multifamily dwelling, they may have done it under the code or under very old um, archaic code, so we're not gonna get a lot of uh, the benefits of more modern construction, modern code. I mean, for instance, the person that lives there, uh, really, uh, under code, they should have had a, a fire escape, a, a secondary means of egress, right? But that dude, if, if we get a fire in the vestibule area here, or that interior area that, that he gets access to his a unit, he's stuck, or he's jumping, or maybe, Ties bed sheets together. I don't know. Also, think about it too. So, Greg, uh, how are you going to chop that up from an ICS perspective? Tricky. That one. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's a rhetorical question. Yeah, I mean, that's not going to be easy. It depends on where the entrances are. They're all separate outside entrances, or if you put inside there's one entrance to branch out. Yeah, oftentimes those, I mean, you've probably been around your district. There's a whole bunch like this where, I mean, they're just, there's like doors and two or three that from the inside, but then they got an outside door for another one. Yeah, really crazy layouts, very unpredictable. All right, let's move on to row homes. So row homes, again, the reason we chose row home, uh, there's a lot of disagreement over the terminology. Some people would say, well, that's a townhouse to me. Well, that's a row home. Uh, Brannigan discourages using the term row or townhouse because uh, there's so many different de definitions. You talk to real estate folks, they'll say, oh, that's a townhouse. No, that's a row home. You talk to construction folks, there's going to be a difference. Talk to code people, it's going to be different. We could have tried to make two separate categories, but really, it doesn't matter. What we care about is, in a row home, it's contiguous, side-by-side, -side, um, row of two to four story single-family dwellings. So, if you take a look at this, you make entry here. This is your occupancy all the way up. And you own all that. So there's no neighbors above you, no, no neighbors below you, none behind you. Your neighbors are only to the Bravo and Delta side of you. This is what a row home looks like. Now, uh, there are, and this is where you get into the discrepancies between a townhouse or a row home. Well, yeah, but this one's got a firewall, uh, but a different one has like a fire partition. And we don't care about that. Uh, yes, the code would differentiate between the two. What we care is that it's configured that you make entry on the first floor and all that is li your living space from here to here. Implication, uh, kitchen fire starts here, where's it going? Are we worried about kitchen fire there? Are we worried about here and here first? No, it's gonna be, it's gonna have unimpeded travel from floor to floor through this one unit, right? In the first 10 minutes, it does not matter if this is a firewall or fire partition. We'll figure that out. So because of that, we said we're going to define these style of houses, uh, these type of multifamily dwellings, as row homes. Um, <clears throat> certainly if they um, have a firewall, we're going to have better protection of fire spread to the exposures to Bravo and Delta. Uh, the one vulnerability is if it gets up into the attic and can run the attic, if, if it's a fu true firewall, it should go all the way to the roof deck maybe even through. If it's a fire partition, we're probably relying on draft stock. Here's some examples. So these are, these are actually called the Audio Street townhouses, but we're going to call them row homes. Okay? So That's these, because the real estate industry calls it a townhouse. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Uh, and, and yeah, we could, we could make a, a you know, differentiate for you guys. This, this has firewalls, for sure. These are apartments, again, in 9th District. Nine district. Uh, they rent out uh, each unit, each unit that you rent, your occupied spaces, uh, you access first floor and you've got two to three stories above it. Um, probably fire partitions and up in the attic there's going to be craft stuff. Here's some more examples. Uh, this one, what type of fire separation do we have between the units? Here's yeah. to be firewalls. Those are firewalls, yeah. Those are wrong. That was very well built. So that's what we mean when we say row home. Okay. Do you want to go over? Yeah, so I'm going to go over some of this real quick and a little bit more of the whys. Um, and then we're going to give you a break. So um, Mike talked about if we can get in the habit of our first arriving engine officer when he's doing a size up saying, you know, engine six is on location, three story alcove style apartment building, we have fire showing on the second floor alpha side or whatever. That paints a pretty good picture to everyone responding on that assignment. To Brian B. Seth, who's riding as a firefighter, he's thinking about, okay, well, it's not like a breezeway where I can back stretch my dry line. I gotta be thinking about that. He may or may not have a conversation with the officer. Do you like to do bundle drop? Do you want me to do, you want to do the pike pull technique? How do we want to, to deploy that line? If he's not able to talk to him, he could at least ask when he gets there. If I'm the BC that's responding, I'm running through my head, how do I want to break up from an ICS perspective? Oh, okay, well, if it's an alcove style, that means one thing to me. If it's breezeway, it means another thing to me, and I'll talk about why in a second. But beyond just the firefighter and the first two engine officer, the driver might have a thought about apparatus positioning, maybe deck gun. If you're a truck officer, 
you're thinking, okay, so an alcove, typically we're, gonna, we're, we're relying on this draft stopping, but there's a lot more space connected in that building as opposed to a, a breezeway. Oftentimes with the breezeway, they neck that down and they recess the uh, HVAC units in there, their AC units, and there's not as much of a pathway for fire travel. Um, if we're talking about an uh, exterior hallway, if it's got an exterior hallway that runs on the Alpha side and the Charlie side, I'm going to probably make it Alpha, the back side Charlie. If it's one side has the exterior hallway, like the Parkview Apartments, I'm going to go Division 1, Division 2, Division 3. Much like a strip mall, row home, Alpha, Delta, Bravo. Let's talk about Breezeway and Alto. Now I'm one BC. There's nine BCs and there's a dozen swing up guys. So I'm not gonna sit here and tell you there's only one way to do it. There's a lot of ways to skin the cat, but I'm gonna tell you the logic behind why we wanted to get people on the same page and to give people a little bit of mental free time while they're responding to size up. When we had our 4th of July fire, I was going through in my mind, if it's alcove style, I'm gonna break it up a certain way. If it's breezeway style, I'm gonna break it up a different way. Once I was able to confirm the style, it drove my ICS chart. Now, there's two things that I'm thinking about when it comes to breaking up from an ICS perspective. One is, can I verbalize that in a clear and concise fashion that's not confusing to people? And the second thing is, I want to make it easy for my second MBC or whoever my functional supervisor is, right? So now let's, let's picture breezeway style apartment, top floor fire. If I make this division three and I assign Chief Ramey to be division three, He's going, to have to, he's going to try to cut down on radio traffic. He's going to be verbalizing with his Division Three crews here, but of course he's going to be assigning people here because we have this, this party wall, this separation, and we need to check for extension there, right? So he's going to be sending crews there. Now what's he have to do? He's either got to run down three stories, run over here, run up three stories, and face-to-face -face with his crew, or the byproduct of a poor chart is radio traffic's going to go up. He may do that once, but after that, guess what? He's going to use his radio. And if he starts using his radio a bunch, I'm going to be forced to split channels. If I split channels, it solves one problem and creates another problem. Because now I have a silo, and it's my job to deconflict that and let you know in Division Charlie what Division Alpha is doing. So if I'm talking about an Alco style building, fires on the front side, that's Alpha, because I can put Greg there. It doesn't have to run all the way around here. I want to put Charlie on the back side. Okay? Now we have alcoves that go all four sides. You, you have two choices here. You can call this the Alpha Delta Division that covers these two, or you, and you can call this the Bravo Charlie Division that covers those two, or you can just assign one or the other, and I would do this via the face-to-face -face with my BC that I'm assigning. Hey, I'm gonna make you Division Charlie. You're gonna have the West End alcove and the North alcove, okay? And again, that's based on access. I need to make it easy for him so he's not running all over the, the place. Because if he is, it takes longer or he's going to use his radio. Does that make sense? If it's a center hallway and your first driving engine officer says, we have a fire in the center hallway type building, if you're a truck officer, you're going, shit, we might be ventilating the public hall. We may be ventilating over the, top, uh, over the actual apartment if it's a top floor fire. So... Like Mike said, we could come up with 20 different things, but you guys would be ready to lynch us. We came up with four broad categories and a couple subcategories, and the purpose behind that is so that each writing position has a little bit of mental prep time and size up time while we're going. It gets us on the same sheet of music. I can tell you, and I know Chief Frank can attest to this, when a BC gets there and we take command, because of the way we deploy without pre-assignments and SOP other than high-rise, it's schizo the first 10 minutes when it's really an escalating incident because we've got to verbalize all these assignments. So I don't have a lot of free mental time to be thinking about this versus this. If it's a breezeway style apartment building, I would prefer, and what I did on our fire on the 4th of July, if the fire is in access from this breezeway, I'm going to make this soup, my division soup, your division alpha. You're responsible for all apartments accessed from that east breezeway. Bat three, your division delta. You're responsible for all apartments accessed from the west breezeway. Now the reality is, you're probably you're not doing 12 apartments most likely. You're probably going to have maybe if it started on the second floor, you have the second floor, third floor, and the back side, maybe uh, one other exposure, right? 
So it's not like you're managing 12 at once. But if you do feel like you're getting a little overwhelmed, you could always say, you know what, I'm going to make uh, 16 on the third floor task force 16. I'm going to make nine on the second floor task force nine. So your division soup can break that up. So that's just a little bit of the logic behind why we've done what we've done in the training guide. One last point to these different types is we're going to find some anomalies that just don't fit, right? So you've got these. Uh, I think that's 951. Yeah. So you've got apartments, you've got three stories of, of residential over commercial. I think I don't know. It doesn't look like there, but I, that's what it's supposed to be. Some, some, the point is some aren't going to fit. This one, this is like five units in one. It doesn't really fit in. So if you roll up and you can't fit it into one of those categories, don't force it. Just call what you say. We'll call it what you see. Uh, a two-story wood frame, fiveplex. Um, this one, it's not real clear what style it is, but uh, how about this one? This is one story, and it's like, uh, I think like eight one-story apartments, but then under half of it, there's a little, like, well here that accesses another extra four apartments. So if it doesn't fit, get as close as you can. Say this is a, uh, a multifamily dwelling, a one-story multifamily dwelling of a wood frame. Uh, and then on a follow-up report, if you can further define it, do. But uh, uh, this is going to cover uh, a vast majority of those multifamily dwellings, but not all. Yeah, so we want this, this to be a little bit more interactive, this part, but really the, the meat of it's going to be the, the scenario. Uh, so we'll have some interaction on this, but we're going to have to go a little bit faster than we intended. So common tactics and, and assignments. Uh, there's a lot of assignments and tactics on any, any uh, building fire. The ones we're going to focus on for this are fire attack, search, rescue, and evacuation. We put those together because those kind of, with a high life hazard, uh, those are some common tactics that, that kind of go hand in hand. Uh, we'll talk about water supply and then a roof report with ventilation and then laddering. So let's start with fire attack. Let me show you a few slides here. And as we go through these, um, like you to, we'll just throw it out. Um, would like to have you guys identify the type of multifamily dwelling, the era and construction, and then when we think about fire attack, uh, where where is the fire? Where is it going? And how do I prioritize prioritize my my lines? Sorry. So type of multifamily dwelling, era and construction. Where is it going? How are you going to put your lines in place? All right. So who wants to tell me what multifamily dwelling type is this? Row yeah, it's a row home, right? What do you think about air and construction? It's modern, modern 60s, 70s. Yeah, 60s, 70s. So uh, probably wood frame, right? But because it's 60s, 70s, does that tell Could us? Could be hand stacked or yeah, but, right, legacy or modern. Yep, it's kind of that overlap period, right? Good, good call. So, fire is obviously, does anyone not see the fire? It's on the second floor here. Uh, What's your what's your concern about this with this fire? Where is it going? Over the yeah, attic. Right. All right. So, who wants to tell me what they would do first as far as line selection? We're talking about fire attack only. Just fire attack. How are you going to prioritize your lines? Let uh, leave it to the hostman to oh, jump up. I probably take uh, 150, maybe 200 foot reconnect and. Line. Charge it in the front yard, knock the shit out of it through the window, and then get through the front door. Okay, so he's going to reset it. Uh, does anyone not like that? Does anyone, would anyone do anything different? Deck gun. Maybe deck gun. Deck gun? You've got to walk through it before I got that out. Sorry. As Kent says, if you have a hydrant, or if you can really control it, if you've got a bail and you can control it, uh, on our fire at uh, Edgewater, uh, Satterley used the deck gun three times, and because he had that bail on it, before we had fire or water supply uh, hooked up, he had only used half of his tank. He still had more than half the tank left. So yeah, that's an option. But I think everyone kind of agrees. Uh, resetting, hitting that right now, does several things for us. It slows it down, but it also possibly keeps it from getting uh, just having that attic take off, right? Okay, so you do that. What's your next line? Where where are you going next with fire attack? To the front door. Front door. Upstairs, we're going to confine it to that, hopefully that room. It might have extended into some other. You see that this is all filled with, with fire, so it's probably the door's open. It's getting air somewhere else. So it may be somewhere else, but we'll, we'll confine it. 
and then we'll extinguish it. Uh, where do we want other lines to go? Add it to the dump side first and then to the ground side. Yeah. So uh, I would probably throw one thing in here. I'm assuming you're, you'd say, let's open up the attic once we get it knocked down here. But then we're going to come in on Bravo and Delta side with other lines, right? Any more, any uh, issues with that? Any other thoughts on that? Where's our draft stop now? Oh yeah. Yeah, it might be. It's kind of hard to see, but right between where the two smokes are coming up through the roofing. Yeah. So start reading. Start reading where where the smoke ends, and that might be an indication where. It's stopping, so uh, it's hard to see if this is like, if it's, it's probably, it looks like it might be pushing through the deck in there, so maybe it's there. And remember, it's two parts, right? So then it would be there. I don't know, it might be moving along that eaves anyway. I guess maybe is the, the two with the doors next to each other are mirrored, so they have maybe not, not a draft stop in there, but maybe between the where the gutter is. It could be. I, the point is, let's start reading the cues we have. And you can kind of tell from the smoke, but we're getting, I mean, there's a few things that's hard to tell. Is that just traveling down uh, in the soffit and popping out there and there? Um, you've got smoke. It looks like it's pushing through the deck right there. So if that's the case, that means it's gotten in here and it's moved all the way to here, which means it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be right there, right? Mm -hmm. right. So I, it's hard to tell. I mean, I don't know anything about this fire. Sure, what, what uh, type of building first? Most likely. Interior hallway. It's not an exact science, but modern order. Center hall. Yeah, probably center hallway. You can see that green door on the bottom, so it's a center hallway deal. I, I might add, too, that if you know on your initial report, go ahead and say it. If you don't know, that's okay. Just say three-story multifamily dwelling and what you have. When you do your follow-up report after your 360 or your 180, whatever you can get, then you can say all units command. We have a center hallway type building. We have fire shown from the Alpha Delta corner, Alpha side. So when we look at this, we have a center hallway unit. A little bit difficult to tell. Uh, well, first off, um, fire first floor, where's the fire gonna go? Up, oh. up, right? So that second and third story are a concern, right? Center hallway, we're worried about that public hall, right? It's difficult to tell with this firefighter there, but the entire opening is showing fire. What does that tell us? It means there's an open door on the other side. It means that there's some type of, because we know fire needs to have a flow path, right? It needs to have a, an in-source of oxygen. So if it's unidirectional flow, all fire, then it's getting air from somewhere else. This is the edge of the building. It could be as simple as there's a window, and this window is broken here. Or, as Chief Ramey said, the hall to the, the, the door to the hallway could be open, it's getting its flow there. So we just need to be mindful of the fact that it's unidirectional. We probably ought to identify that flow path. So we've established fires on the first floor, it's going to two and three. What's going to be our tactic? What are we going to do for uh, prioritizing our water? What's the first thing we're going to do? You reset that? Reset yeah. it. Totally agree. We had someone earlier ask, what about cooling that window? with the hose line to prevent it from breaching. Uh, I would say hit the fire from the exterior. Yeah. Now, I've been on fires where BFD cool. guys got burned from exterior water application, but that wasn't because we were putting water from the outside. It's because we were using a fog pattern, we closed the window, and we caused steam conversion. We burned ourselves from steam. So as long as you use a tight uh, stream, I'm a big believer in the NIST UL. I think it makes a lot of sense. So quick water on that there. You need to identify our flow path. Then make entry, try to protect that public hall and stairs. If you're a truck company and we have smoke that's going up, mushrooming to the top, Chief Ramey may order you to do vertical ventilation of the public hall so that we can try to open, the, you know, clear that out, right? And try to maintain tenability there. So our search priorities are going to be people most threatened, fire, floor above, top floor. All right, next one? Yeah. All right. What type of multifamily dwelling? Yeah, it's an exterior. It's hard to tell. Uh, era in construction? Yeah, lightweight wood frame. 80, so it could be, it could have uh, this. I don't like this picture because 
can you see what's going on with the roof there? What kind of roof do you think that is? <laughs> well, yeah, but uh, is it peaked or is it a flat roof? Peaked. Peak. It looks it's, like a peak. It looks like a peak. It's not. When I first looked at this, I thought so, but it's not. Um, um, anyway, so it, it may have a cock loft, a narrow cock loft. Where, so where's the fire at now? This is actually floor two right here. That's three. Second working way. Second, Second working way up to to three, and then it may have some way to get into that that flat roof cock loft. So, how about uh, how are we going to prioritize our lines? What's our first our first line? Reset again. Reset yeah, with pitch. with the deck gun. With deck gun, that's an option. And get it possibly get a water supply as soon as possible. Yeah, just keep it in the deck. deck gun or a hand line, right? And, and Keep in mind, guys, we're not trying to tell you how you should do this. We're just trying to generate some thoughts and get some, some uh, dialogue going on this. So, yeah, we hit that. Then we need a line where? To the second floor. The second floor. Second floor. Possible bumper drive. Yeah, so six-sided box, right? We got fire here. Uh, above's going to be thrown. We got to check for extension there, right? And we need to check Bravo and Delta exposures, too. So, yeah, and then obviously... In the attic. If that was a peak, true peak, peak roof, then that would be a high priority, right? Getting up and checking to make sure it hadn't gotten into the attic space. Is there anything else you want to mention? There? Okay. Um, do I hit escape? Yeah, I escape. No, you do this because you're going to do this somewhere. Okay. All right, let's say what type? It's like balloon, balloon maybe. Okay, that's a construction type. But what type of building? What can we oh, broadcast? Historic. Converted, yep, looks like a converted to me. And then what did you say, Cody? So what is it? Wood frame? Wood frame. Probably wood frame. What era? Historic to industrial, probably, right? Mm -hmm. So knowing historic to industrial wood frame, what are we going to want to rule out? Is it balloon frame or not, right? So looks to me that you got smoke all over the place. Look at the eaves, the soffit along Bravo. So I'm I'm a little well, nervous if I'm a BC because I'm like, is this balloon frame? And it looks like it might be in the structure. The windows lining up on the Bravo side. Yep. So as we move along, you can see the windows are lined up on the Bravo side there. Mm -hmm. Look at where it's at. Look at that soffit line there on the top floor. A little bit further. Where's that? It's in the attic. It's in the attic and it's actually attacking structural members. Notice the smoke is brown. It's not just white giving off its moisture. So I'm I'm like, all right boys, enough is enough. We're gonna be probably pulling people out here. And sure enough, given enough time, I went right up to the dormer in the attic space in that balloon frame constructed home. We're looking from the Charlie, the, the Bravo side at Charlie, Bravo Charlie Corner is what you're looking at there. Um, another student in another class noticed that the house next door uh, to the left of it is more of a modern, it's not a balloon frame constructed home. That's good to just, I mean, in the north end we have a hodgepodge of places. All right, so that, that's fire attack. We talked about that. Um, let's move on to talk about search, rescue, and evacuation. Um, again, we're going to have a high life hazard in these places, so we are our life hazard size up. It's sort of a paraphrase of our SOP on rescue. So we're obviously going to go after the, the most threatened people, then the greatest number, and then uh, people in exposures. Now, uh, one thing to consider, we have people threatened. It depends on how threatened they are. Uh, that will determine our tactics. We can do rescue. We can do direct rescue, right? We can evacuate if maybe it's uh, a non-IDLH area. Maybe it's a separate breezeway that's not threatened at all. Then we can use, have the cops go over there or someone uh, not a valuable critical resource go evacuate. Uh, and then we can also choose fire attack, right? So let's take a look at this one. What do you see? So just so you know, there's a. this is different. This doesn't fit any of our styles per se. There's, you walk into this entry here, and there's an alcove that serves 
like four separate apartments, including that one. So there's a, a, a vestibule here, and here's the apartment fire. You got two people up on ladders up there. What are your thoughts? I should have put the fire down there. Fire. Yeah. Were they going for they were going for the life saving work by getting someone who really their life was not in threat? They they have some time, right? So maybe better use of our time and resources would be to put that fire out first and then hell maybe they can walk them down through the inside a bit later. Uh, or have some uh, a later arriving company, have your driver throw a ladder up there, they look able bodied, have them come down. Shoot, maybe that fire was not much of anything. Uh, before they decide to lay fire attack and throw a ladder up there. So uh, keep that in mind. How about this one here? So this is a four-story center hallway configuration. Fire's on the third floor. This guy, what do, you, what do you think he's doing? Yeah. He's out looking out the window like, hey, what are all these fire engines doing out here? <laughs> yeah, he's not even, I mean, the hallway might even be tenable because this looks like a fairly modern uh, building may have protected stairwells, which means the fire is going to be confined to that floor of origin. He could probably possibly walk down. If not, hey, sir, just stay put, and then we can go to work putting the fire out, right? How about this guy? We need help. Yeah. Look pretty eminent? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he agrees with you. Okay, then just jump. Oh. He jumped. Uh, so that's a place where, yeah, direct rescue is probably... At the next photo? No, he, he lived. He lived. And his three other family members. He, first, he got out there and he threw his kids off to see if it'd be okay. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> there were some bystanders that had a, uh, a makeshift fire net and they caught him. All four of them lived. This is in Russia. Yeah. Probably. All right, on this next one. So, uh, take a look at this one. You can kind of see, um, obviously, I believe. I've seen this. This is an alcove. It's not a freezer. Okay. And uh, obviously, people aren't getting out. So, poor people trapped up there. What are you doing? What's our Cody? What would you do first? You're gonna have to put water on the fire to make it better. It's my opinion. Put water on. Water fire. Yeah. I mean, why not knock that down? And yeah, they could be. Um, there could be some people in there that need help right now. Um, but. Imagine how much worse it's going to get if we don't deal with that fire. It's going to get a whole lot worse. We live in an area where we have our second end is pretty close. That could be a quick assignment for that second person. What tactics are we thinking in this type of situation as far as for rescue? VES. VES, VES. right? Yeah. VES, uh, if they're able bodied, maybe they're on the Charlie side and they open the window and it's clear as a bell. There's no smoke coming in out over their head. I mean, they could self rescue. We just go tow, tow a handful of ladders around the back side and, and then come down on our own. So anyway, something to think about. Just because we have a known rescue doesn't mean that is our tactic, our immediate tactic, right? We have a, a number of uh, tactics are, at our disposal. So we'll talk about roof reporting and ventilation. And let me just start this by saying that I'm a huge supporter of NIST-UL and the research. and. Uh, However, I do believe that there uh, is a time and a place for vertical ventilation. Uh, our fire service tends to be fairly alpha personalities, and my observation in my career seems like we go from one extreme to the next. So prior to the 80s, it was smooth bore nozzles. Then the vendors came around in the 80s, had some awesome nozzles. We changed and threw away all of our smooth bore nozzles. Then Andy Frederick and company come around in the late 90s, they start talking about uh, fight and fire with smoothbore nozzles again so we have better GPM, better knockdown. You'll get your European counterparts, they're talking about little droplets of water again. Um, I would like to find some level of moderation. I'd prefer not to throw away the fog no nozzle, I'd prefer not to throw away the smoothbore nozzle. NIST-UL came out with the uh, NIST studies talking about vertical ventilation and no surprise you're going to increase the heat release rate when you vertically ventilate. But that doesn't mean we never vertically ventilate, in my opinion. We've had great success here locally with, with uh, single-family dwellings with steam conversion. And that's my technique of choice. But when I talk about a uh, multifamily dwelling, and I'll just use the breezeway as an example, 
our fire that we had on 4th of July, second floor fire extends to the third floor, gets up in the attic. When it does that, I have, uh, Mike had already ordered truck five to do a roof report. They go to the roof and they come back and they give me a roof report, which is the roof report says peaked roof. We have pressurized smoke coming from the attic vent on the fire side. We're talking about pressurized smoke here. We're not talking about the soil pipes with lazy smoke that if that plastic pipe starts heating up, it's got some lazy smoke coming out of it. We're talking about pressurized smoke from like those eyebrow vents, right? So he gives me that, that report and my reply was, copy, go ahead and vertically ventilate on the fire side and let's see if we can take some pressure off the draft stopping. The reason that I did that is it's not like a single family dwelling where we can run down the hallway, poking ceiling and stretching our hose line behind us to get ahead of it, right? Now we're talking about down three floors over to the other. Hopefully we have lines in place, right? So here's a picture of that fire. And what we're looking at is the other side of that draft stop. So here's our building. This is exactly what it looked like. I'm sorry, Joe. This is what it looked like. Fire's here, it comes up here. The draft stopping is running longitudinal here. So it's going like this. We're taking the picture from this side, okay? So we're looking at it, and you can see the evidence of the pressure that that fire event, being a pressure event, is causing on the draft stopping. They ventilate over the fire, it takes the pressure off. But it also increases the heat release rate, just like NIST UL said it would do. But shortly after I give him the assignment to vertically ventilate, you hear me talk to Division Alpha and confirm he's got his hose lines in place. We're opening the roof up. He says, yes, we do. 10 minutes later, EMS soup knocks on my window, says, uh, there's a lot of fire showing through the roof. And I look down, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. All they had to do is reposition to another bedroom. It was up in that attic section there. But they had lines in place. They were able to knock that down really quick. It actually worked out pretty good. So some people think of it as controversial. For me personally, it de it's, it's incident dependent on what we're dealing with. If it's a residential structure with vaulted ceilings, how successful are we going to be at you know, poking holes in the, in the ceiling? It's not going to be as easy. So in that case, probably vertical ventilation, maybe even take a hose line up there. Okay. So that's our take on uh, roof reporting and ventilation. Water supply, we'll make this real quick. So I think the key, it's pretty obvious here, let's not block access. Engine 16 did a great job on that Edgewater uh, apartment. In fact, you can hear on the radio um, recording, Pettinger says, uh, I think it was on the radio, he said, make sure we get that supply line off to the side so we don't block access. And they did a great job. It was wide open right until they got to engine 9, which we didn't work as good as we could have. We had a hydrant. 20 feet past where we were at. And sadly knew that, he went forward, looked for it, and he's like, can't find it. He didn't, wasn't gonna spend a whole bunch of time trying to, to find it, but uh, really try and know where all those hybrids are at so you've got options. Uh, if you are second in and uh, you know the layout of the complex and you can come in back, backwards, try that. That's great, that leaves a lot open, does not uh, block access. And we may need to have multiple hybrids anyway. If the incident goes big, we've got multiple breezeways involved, maybe a second building's even gotten on fire, uh, then we might need extra hydrants, or even if it goes defensive. Here's some examples. You see this one, uh, <clears throat> supply line, everything looks like nice and neatly organized. The attack lines are over the top of the supply line, as opposed to here where um, their large Xamar hose is over the top of their hand line, so and it looks like it's blocking path that apparatus might want. So, <clears throat> water supply. The last thing we want to talk about is laddering, and and we want to talk about this because um, it's I think it's a more of a philosophical point and about whether we are proactive or reactive as a department. I I believe that when we were assigning RIT early on we were a lot more proactive on throwing ladders. That was sort of a, almost a given that the RIT company would be putting ladders to second floor uh, windows when we knew we had people up there. Uh, I took a class from some guys in Colorado Springs and they talked about their ladder culture, which was really, they, they wanted to be proactive. And that meant uh, <clears throat> operationally getting ladders up quickly. It also meant knowing their tools. They, they went out and they practiced. They knew how to use, how to carry multiple ladders at one time, how to throw ladders in different configurations and, and do it as a single person. 
Um, and they, you see pictures of their fire scenes, a lot of them look like this, where they've got ladders all over the place. And, um, you know, so the question is, can we be more proactive? And if so, how do we become more proactive? Who do we give the assignment to and when? We certainly we're not going to give that assignment before we do fire attack, right? But uh, <clears throat> can a truck company, uh, maybe a second inning truck company, or another company that's being forward staged, grab ladders on their way in and dump, dump them in the front yard? doesn't mean they, they need to be the ones that throw them. Someone else could, could throw them, right? So uh, Colorado Springs did a, uh, had a, an apartment fire, a three-story center hallway apartment fire a handful of years ago, about I don't know, three or four years ago. And they did 86, 85 uh, rescues from ladders uh, at that building. And a lot of them was because um, it wasn't just a whole bunch of people throwing a whole bunch of people at that problem. <clears throat> they had really heads up, very proficient uh, firefighters that took a whole bunch of ladders to where they needed and just started setting them up. And they got just gobs of ladders up to the, to the second and third floors. A lot of able-bodied people just came out on their own. They had to go up and help some people out. So uh, just something to think about, something for us to, to mull over uh, philosophically as a department.